Um, my name is Nico Yosutis. I have 20 minutes, which means two minutes per each slide to tell you about what I like best about C17. So no big introduction. Let's first start with the first things. The first thing you will really like is inline variables. Inline variables is a way uh, that you can now have the ability to have static or global objects inside your header file, and you don't have to define them in one of the translation units. <coughs> what this means is we have now the ability to provide full libraries, including libraries that provide some global or static objects just inside header files. And that will be used a lot, because in a lot of places, you only had just a CPP file to initialize some object there. So here's an example. That's the first thing I did. I wrote my own new tracker, which I can use whenever I want to track calls of new by just including this as a header file. That's enough. No change in compiling, in, in compiler flex, no change in uh, linker um, files, etc. So because this um, new tracker does a usual thing, it overloads operate, uh, operator new, and it uses a helper class. And in this helper class, we count the number of malloc calls, we count and sum the size of the malloc calls, and we have a, a, um, a global um, Boolean tra tracking or, and deciding whether we want to track each and every malloc call. And that's now possible to implement it in a way that inside the header file, you just say inline static, and that's it. Any, any CPP file can now include this header, and from this moment on, you are part of this tracker. Even if multiple uh, tools, uh, multiple translation units include this file, they share the same counter and the same sum and the same state of tracing. Number two, compile time if. The next thing we have is now the ability inside a function to have a compile time switch between two different alternatives. And this is important if a runtime switch would not work, as in this example. It's not only because of performance, it's because sometimes it's not possible to use a runtime switch. Look at this code. I have here a function converting a past argument t to a string, and I have different ways to do so. So in the first um, case, um, I call the function std to string, which is supported by um, integral, integral and uh, arithmetic types only. So this code, in the first case, would not compile for any type which is not integral or floating point. <coughs> and in the second case, I just take the string as it is. And in the third case, I use a constructor. This constructor would not compile if my argument is an integral value. So whatever I pass, only some of this code is compilable. And therefore, this compile time if is necessary, because a runtime if would never compile this code. So um, this will help me to provide this in one function instead of doing some tricky template magic here. Oh, my ACO is close to the end. Okay, let's see. So you can use this, combine this with another feature, which is the ability to have conditional checks at compile time with an initialization. We also have this feature. And this is the core of my talk here. It's not that C17, the best thing is just one feature. The best thing is a combination of multiple new features. So look at this. We can now say here, I have two different implementations for how I wanted to deal with a collection depending on whether the elements are pointers or not. So in the then case, I have the implementation for pointers. And in the else case, I have the other implementation. And only one of them gets compiled. But 
whatever I do here, I first have to lock my vector to be usable, which is done in the initialization here at the beginning in both cases. And as you can see, this, this might be a runtime initialization. So the check here is only, only the condition is a compile time condition. By the way, this if const x requires that it is a runtime condition, it does not fall back to a, uh, that it is a compile time condition, it does not fall back to a runtime condition if this is not the case. Next thing, variant. Assume we have a polymorphic data uh, hierarchy, the classical way to implement polymorphism. Uh, there will be new ways now as we learned yesterday from Louis Dion. But this is just the old way saying I have a base class with an interface defining an interface and a lot of virtual functions. So the usual way is I have a vector of geometric object pointers. I can initialize it. The problem with pointers is we have to use new. And then we can iterate. And when we iterate, we iterate over pointers. So we have to use pointer semantics. And copying is an issue, etc. as uh, Louis pointed out yesterday in his talk. And the worst thing is, when I no longer need the elements in my vector, I've, before I delete them, I have to go through to each F element and call delete. Otherwise, I have a memory leak. So we can fix that with shared pointer and unique pointer to some extent, but there are all, still there are some problems. So here's a new way to do that. We have variant now in the standard. Variant is um, an implementation of either or, of one of two types, of a finite set or closed set of different types. We can now say my vector contains what elements which are either circle or line, no reference semantic anymore. We can use value semantics now. So no new is called here. Just pu push the elements in the vector. And when I draw the elements, I visit them in a way that I have to iterate over all these elements and decide there at runtime if it's a circle or if it's a line, then I do one draw or the other draw, which I can, for example, do by, co by using uh, generic lambda here. This is, by the way, a local V table which is used here by the V, v function. So we still have V tables, we still have the performance overhead, but we don't have the performance overhead and the drawbacks of calling new and delete. So when I, at the end, no longer need all the elements in the vector, I simply call clear, and that's it. So no pointers anymore involved. No new and delete in application code. Underlying in the vector, it's used still. And, and the big benefit is the elements in the vector are located together, which is not the case if we have pointers referring to somewhere else. And this no longer needs polymorphism by inheritance at all. So strike your base class, remove each and every virtual, and it will still compile and work. And it has, as I said, it has the same runtime um, uh, as uh, doing the classical approach, but when you visit and so when you draw the different elements or move them, but when you initialize this, uh, things will dramatically be different. And even if you iterate over the elements, things can be a lot faster and better. Here's one issue, though. Assume in the visitor, we want to have different implementations for different types. Well, we can use classical function objects and have different operator function calls, function call operator implementations. But lambdas are so easy to use. Everybody likes lambdas because they hide the fact that they are templates. So can we use here two different lambdas in the visitor? Yes, we can. By combining this new variant feature of C++17 with a couple of other cool C++17 features, we can do it the following way. You can have a variant and say, I want to visit this variant, and depending on its current value, I have one lambda dealing with the case that this is a cycle currently, and one lambda dealing with the case that this is currently a line. And guess what? One of them might even be a generic lambda, so you can have a default case and a special case, whatever you, however you like that. 
And what is the trick? What is done here? Overload here is an object initialized by two lambdas. And combining these two lambdas in a function object that has function call operations for both. How is this done? Look at this. It's pretty straightforward and simple for the expert C++ programmer. <laughs> so this might be part of the library. So you have the following. You say, my type is derived from a couple of base classes. Each of the type of my lambdas is one base class, is taken as one type. And then I derived the function call operators from all my base classes, which are the functor types. So I have them all available. The only problem is, usually I have to specify the base types of a class or a struct explicitly. But we have a new feature called deduction guides or class, uh, class, argument, uh, class template argument deduction. And there we can provide a rule that you no longer have to explicitly specify the class template arguments. They can be deduced by the constructor. So this constructor takes uh, two lambdas. So these two lambdas in the deduction guide you see here is used as, as deriving the types of the, this class that is defined. By the way, the other feature used here is that this is still an aggregate. So you can use aggregate deduction. In C++ 17, we have decided that aggregates can now have base classes. So this is a combination of multiple features to make this code work and compile and work. And that's pretty easy for a couple of programmers. It will be used. Two other things here. Again, let's combine two cool features we have in C17. The first thing we have is we have incorporated boost file system, which means that we now have a portable way to deal with paths in a file system, to create directories, to over, uh, iterate over directories, to get attributes of files like the file size or the rights, access rights, etc. So this is here is a small example of it. It's a pretty simple piece of code. We have a vector of file system paths. And this vector is initialized by recursively iterating through the file system on a given directory. So this is initializing the vector of file system paths by all the paths that of all the files that are in this directory recursively in this uh, tree, I should say. And this is done by copying from, by using the copy operator, uh, excuse me, copy algorithm, uh, taking the begin and end of this iterator, directory <coughs> iterator, and copy these values into the vector. So far, so good. Now we have a vector of file system paths, of all the paths, current paths in my tree. So let's now compute the size of the whole of all the files in my directory. How should we do that? Well, we have to go to each and every file and ask for the file size, and then we can accumulate the results. This is something we can do sequentially, but taking the file size is not the cheapest operation, so that's, let's use parallel algorithms, which we have now available. And here's the code. There's a new algorithm, by the way, which is exactly for this purpose. It will be used a lot in future, I promise you. It will be one of the most used uh, algorithms we have in the standard now. And the algorithm does two things. It does a transformation which, which, uh, with each element you give, and then does, a, does some accumulation in whatever way you want to define it. So it's, you can translate it with transform accumulate, but in, uh, in, in, in our industry, it's also well known as map reduce, which does the same thing. So we say, OK, for example, here, look at the end of this call. We have a first um, lambda or a first um, predicate or transformation 
taking a path, if it's a regular file, takes a file size, otherwise takes zero. So that's a transformation. We transform each path in its file size, if there's a size. And then let's combine all the results by adding them together so we use plus as the um, accumulation. And we do this in parallel by passing and parallel execution policy. So I try that out. It reduced the runtime on my system for a non-trivial, so a bigger directory, by 50%, just by using here a different parallel execution policy. Um, so again, we combine different features, file system, library, and parallel SDL. And let me come to the final point here. And the final point is, what I like is that <laughs> finally after six years, we seem to be, well, finishing the try to introduce uniform initialization. This was a goal we introduced with C++11. One of the problems we have is it's always tough to do the little last pieces so we introduced with C++11 uniform initialization using braces. So what has happened since then? First of all, in C++11, braces were better already by detecting narrowing. So if you pass a negative or a floating point value to an unsigned integral type, um, it worked better when we had something like a vector of string uh, because this is self-explanatory code creating, initializing a vector of having the values 8 and 15. If you used, you know that probably parenthesis here, you have a very surprising result. Um, but we made some problems which we fixed now in C17. One of the biggest problems was look at this auto X brace initialized by 42, was initializing in the past this by an initializer list. Now it's an int. And that's what everybody reads here. But it hasn't been that case. And the second thing is now an error, because there is no useful application of it. The only problem we did is we still have a different behavior when we use copy initialization, so use the equal sign. Then this changes the type of x dramatically, which is a nightmare, a big mistake we made, but we made it. So don't use uh, copy initialization anymore. Um, then we have enums, enums, enums now can be initialized directly by an integral value, which has not been possible before. We introduced that in C++17. And for aggregates, you can now use a brace initialization even if they have base classes. You have seen an application of that a few minutes ago. And for empty braces, it also works. So I'm now ready. I am ready to teach each and everybody use brace initialization everywhere without copy initialization. That's the best way to initialize things. Now, the least surprising way, we should really start to teach that. And all these expert C++ programmers who love to see complicated code, we should ban them from the community. <laughs> Well, might be offending you. I'm not sure. So we still, of course, have some problems. Atomics uh, need a formal fix to so have the useful behavior with brace initialization. We are about to do that for C++20. And then there's a strange rule. If an aggregate has a deleted constructor, you can use still initialize it with empty braces, which is absolutely crazy. But there are reasons for that. Um, so that's it. That's my talk. We have a lot of cool stuff, but the interesting thing of C++17 is combining these different features as I have done in a couple of slides here. Uh, there is already a book available. I, the, the reason I know that is because I'm currently writing a book about C++17. If you are interested, look at it. It's not done yet, but you can buy it already um, because I do it the way that I ship updates for free to everybody who buys it, and I can introduce feedback I get from you for future versions until it is finally 
being printed. Now it's only available as PDF or other ebook formats. That's it. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend and see you next year. Thanks.